Hi, Mr. Richards here, and today we're going to learn about the real number system. Now, we've learned about rational numbers, with rational numbers being able to be written as fractions. So, what does that make irrational numbers, though? Well, an irrational number is a number that cannot be written as a fraction. Additionally, when written as decimals, irrational numbers neither repeat nor terminate. Some examples of irrational numbers include, well, pi. As pi, we abbreviate it 3.14, but it keeps going at 1, 5, 9, and it goes forever and ever and ever, and never repeats and never terminates or ends. We also have, say, the square root of 5 is an irrational number, as that's about equal to 2.236, and it just kind of keeps going. So, irrational numbers can't be written as a fraction, and written as decimals, they neither repeat nor terminate. Now then, the real number system includes rational numbers and irrational numbers. And of course, with our rational numbers, we have the natural numbers 4, 9, 10. Whole numbers brings in the number 0. Integers bring in the negatives, and rational numbers then are any number that can be written as a fraction. So, let's see if we can classify numbers. Name all sets of numbers to which each integer number belongs. Write natural, whole, integer, rational, or irrational. Well, in the first one, we have 0 0.246, but the 6 repeats. And since the 6 repeats, we can then, in a way, write that as a fraction. So this can be considered a rational number since we have the repeating. The square root of 17, however, is irrational. Negative 7.25, well, that is rational, but it's not an integer, as you have that fractional portion. But the square root of 225, well, the square root of 225 is 15. And 15, if we look at, well, that is a natural number. That is a whole number. That is an integer, and that is a rational number. So it fits the four. Replace the blank with a less than, greater than, or equals to make a true statement. We have the square root of 125, and we have 11 and 7 eighths. Well, if we use our calculator, we can get the square root of 125 to be about equal to 11.1803, and it keeps going. And 11 and 7 eighths, well, that's 11 point. If we do 7 divided by 8 in our calculator, we would get 8.75. So which is bigger, 11.18 or 11.87? There's our less than sign. So the square root of 125 is less than 11 and 7 eighths. Let's continue. Ordering the set from least to greatest. Well, let's look then at our 6 and 1 fourth, our square root of 38, our 6 and 5 tenths, and our square root of 36. Let's get these all into some form of decimal form. 
the square root of 36 is 6. 6 is 6 and 5 tenths. We don't have to do much with that. The square root of 38, well, that's going to be bigger than the square root of 36. We already know that. But the square root of 38 is about 6.164. And then 6 and 1 fourth is 6.25. Now, when it comes to ordering these, it can be easier to throw some zeros in here. So I have everything lined up into the tens, hundreds, thousands spot. So now I have the six part is true with all of them, but then I have 250 thousandths, 164 thousandths, 500 thousandths, and, well, no thousandths. So when I go to put these in order, my no thousandths is going to be my least, then my 164 thousandths is my next, then 250 thousandths, then 500 thousandths. So when I go to write my final answer, write it using the original numbers from the question. We have the square root of 36 first, then the square root of 38, followed by 6 and 1 fourth, then 6 and 5 tenths. Those are the numbers ordered from least to greatest. In our next example, we're going to solve equations, but rounding to the nearest tenth if necessary. Now, we've talked before to solve equations that you use inverse operations. So in an equation like 2x equals 14, well, the opposite of division, uh, multiplication, is division. So you would divide by that 2 on both sides to get your variable alone and to get x equals 7. Well, you can follow the same logic with these questions, where you say, well, what's the opposite of squaring a number? How about taking a square root of a number? So I can take, in example A, if I have a squared equals 25, if I actually take the square root of both sides, the square root of a squared is, ta-da, a. Now, that's going to equal plus or minus the square root of 25 once I take that square root. So a is going to actually equal plus or minus 5. Think about it. What is 5 squared? Well, 5 times 5 is 25. What is negative 25, or negative 5 squared? Well, negative 5 times negative 5 is a positive 25. So for this equation, I actually get both answers, the plus or minus 5. So you could keep your answer plus or minus 5 written just like that, or you could write your answer as 5 comma negative 5. Either answer works. Now, when I look at B, if I have B squared equals 90, I again can take the square root of both sides, and B is going to equal plus or minus the square root of 90. And if we use our calculator, we would get b equals plus or minus about 9.5. So this is going to be an approximation now. And so we can write our answer, b is about equal to plus or minus 9.5, or you could again list it 9.5 and negative 9.5. Either way works. What about c cubed equaling 64? Well, if we can take the square root of both sides, why can't we take the cubed root? So we could actually take the cube root of both sides here. And the cube root of 
c cubed is, well, c equals, now for cube roots, we're actually not going to write the plus or minus. It's just going to equal, in this case, a positive because our 64 is positive. Well, what is the cube root of 64? 4. And again, it's not going to be plus or minus for our cube roots automatically. It's going to be whatever the 64 is. Since that is positive right now, our answer is going to also be positive since 4 times 4 times 4 is a positive 64. As we move into our last example, d, 2d cubed equals negative 250. Well, before we take the cube root of both sides, we need to get our d alone. So we actually need to divide by 2 on the left and right sides here. That's going to leave me with d cubed equals negative 250 divided by 2 is negative 125. Now, now I can take the cube root of both sides here. And d is going to equal negative 5. Now, this one is negative since the original was negative. So if we're taking the cube root of a negative number, we're going to get a negative answer. When we take a cube root of a positive number, we're going to get a positive answer. Contrast that to the square roots of our positive numbers, it's going to be positive or negative. So there is a little bit of attention to detail that needs to be paid here. Again, when we take the square root of both sides, we're going to get plus or minuses as our answer. We take cube roots, whether it's going to be positive or negative depends on the number we're taking the cube root of. When it's a positive, our answer stays positive. When it's a negative, our answer changes into a negative. Can we use a formula to solve? Sure. The formula for aspect ratio, r, is r equals s squared divided by a, where s is the wingspan in feet, and a is the area of the wing. What is the wingspan of a hang glider if the aspect ratio is 6.4 and the area of the wing is 40 square feet? Well, let's write down that original equation. We have r equals s squared over a. Now look, let's look for the numbers that were given. We are looking for wingspan. Well, s is the wingspan, so we know we're going to be looking for s. What about our r and our a? Well, our r is aspect ratio, and we're told the aspect ratio is 6.4. So we can put in the 6.4 for r. a is the area of the wing. We're told the area of the wing is 40 feet, and that's going to go on the bottom. So we can put a 40 on the bottom. So we have 6.4 equals s squared divided by 40. Now, the way to get rid of a division by 40 is actually to multiply by 40. So if I multiply both sides by 40, that ends up canceling out on the right side. And 40 times 6 and 4 tenths is 256. Well, that equals s squared. And as we practiced previously, we're going to take the square root of both sides. And the square root of 256 is 16. So 16 equals s. Now, before you go, Mr. Richards, I thought you were saying this is plus or minus. Since I take a square root, it's always going to be plus or minus. Oh, wait a minute. This is a real life example here. So let's think, does a negative number in this question make sense? We're talking about aspect ratios and wingspans and areas. Are we going to really have a negative area? No, we're not. So uh, even though when you take a square root of both sides, you can get a plus or minus, in this application of it, 
we're just going to keep it at a positive 16 feet. Hope you learned something. Good luck.